I have been asked by my Maori kinsmen why I left New Zealand. The reason is that during my term of office in New Zealand as medical officer of health to the Maori people, I found that I had to make a very close and intensive study of Maori arts and crafts and of Maori uh, social organization and language. This led me back towards Polynesia where these things originated from, from cent central Polynesia to the Hawaii of the Maori people. I naturally wanted to go there. So in 1927, when the Bishop Museum embarked on a five years program of intensive research work in the anthropology of Polynesia and invited me to form one of the research workers, I accepted it. The Maoris have made great progress since I left and they are becoming uh, a, a pattern, as it were, to the development of native races. They form a pattern that administrators of other island groups can copy or emulate, and also they act as a stimulus and encouragement to the other native races of the Pacific to follow the example of the Maoris in leading on to advancement in their adjustments to modern civilization. Crusts of old seabeds form the skyline here and rim the hills beneath which three lakes lie, Tutira Waikopiro or Rakai, two fringed with trees, one bare. Orakai, bleak six-acre watering hole in pastoral hollow midst run cattle lies, near bare of trees and sulfurous at times, mirror to stock and sky and slip-scarred hill. One ridge away are lakes of gentler shores, where willow softness brings. First Waikopiro, guardian of ancient things, ringed round by branches set by pioneers. Then hard against Waikopiro, over the narrow band where lay the fastness of Te Rewapa, a mile and more of sweet fresh water clear, Tutira, ringed by legends of her land. Tautenga Rock was marked for the log Te Rewa Ahinitu, which floated towards the shore whenever death approached a lakeside dweller. Pits tell on many an ancient hill spur. Here warriors have waited to astound their lake's attackers. Now become grazing ground, sheep wear them smooth as wavelets on Tutira. Shira and Mastera have understood, like naturalists who studied on her banks, fluidity is all to this expanse, 500 acres with a thousand moves. Birds rest here safe. Yet the lake's life can cease, time threatens it, for westward yard a year, the inflowing Papakiri builds, is coming near the eel-rich outflowing creek. And down the creek, a treacherous waterfall cuts down to drain Tutira's life away, cuts deeply into yielding papa clay, down toward its base below Tutira's keel. This outflow leapt, not thirty years gone by, clear to the pool down from the tall cliff's crest. Each year the takeoff's lower. Creek does his roaring best to lower his course and drain the lake bed dry. Traveller, if seeking tales of this lake's past, ask of the Ngati Kurumokihi about the island Te Tauronga Koao in days when it was treeless and bore palisade and teko teko. The warriors, while Tuhungas chanted karakias, forsaking their women, launched the canoes they had hidden and taking but men children with them, fled the dark island. Beneath the lake, those carved canoes remain, but legends of old battles drift away at altitudes where seashells face the sky that grew before man lived to fight for fame. All passes. But today, the lakes are fair, life's to be lived and time to be well spent. Traveler, forget the past and be content that lakes are placid in the morning air. Bundles containing sections of a prefabricated hut are being loaded into a Royal New Zealand Air Force Dakota at Wigram. These building materials, made into 200-pound packs, have been prepared and packed by the Ministry of Works for dropping over the Southern Alps. With loading completed, the Dakota prepares for takeoff.
After leaving the airfield, the course is set for a dropping area near the Mueller Glacier. Here, the packages are to be parachuted to men on the mountainside who have climbed from the Hermitage to repair and enlarge the Mueller hut. Dropping crew wearing special safety harness move the packages into position at the open doorway. As the plane loses height, a warning bell sounds. The drop is made from low altitude to prevent high winds from carrying the packs away from the dropping area. The pilot signals with a second bell and the first delivery drops to the target, which is indicated by a circle of snow. To ensure that the parachute's open, a rip cord from each pack is attached to the static line inside the plane. Jagged peaks and hazardous flying conditions are all in the day's work for the dropping crew as they stand ready with another load. The valuable experience gained by the RNZAF during the war years is put to good use on this peacetime aerial delivery. <laughs>